Kalispera. It's amazing to be here in Athens, the home of Asclepios, the, god, the Greek god of healing, and in Greece, where so much of modern medicine has been derived from Hippocrates and others, um, Galen and, for, and, and, and beyond. And the formation and the foundation of modern medicine is, has been formed here and has really informed the rest of the world and can inform the future of healthcare as well. But I thought before we look into the future, we often take a bit of a back to the future look. And I had a chance to return uh, to my roots at, to Massachusetts General Hospital, where I did my medical training, uh, for its 200th anniversary. That's very old in the United States, very, very young here. And I uh, had a reunion of the, of the doctors I trained with. And I found myself, after one of the receptions, at one of the most famous spots of healthcare history. This is called the Ether Dome, the spot where in 1846, this lucky patient was the very first patient to get general anesthesia with his surgery. And if you go to the Ether Dome today, it's frozen in time from 1846. Nothing has changed. Um, and it's a very historic spot. I wandered about four minutes down the hall to the ward where I spent my first month as a brand new doctor. And I found also, in over 15 years, that was frozen in time. Some of the same alarms were beeping, some of the same nurses, some of the same patients. Um, the only difference was that uh, the young doctor was pushing around a cart with an old computer and printing out the electronic record and putting it in the chart. And I thought, even at a great institution like Massachusetts General Hospital, medicine is still practiced like it's been done for hundreds or sometimes thousands of years, still stuck in silos, in departments, in old definitions of how healthcare has been organized, uh, with rate waiting rooms. <laughs> And we're in the new age now, a new age of technology. We can define medicine beyond just body parts and specialties in new and powerful ways, with connected health, with digital health, with the empowered patient. And we need to change our definition. Instead of how we practice medicine today with most of our dollars on sick care, we can change our definition to spending more of our focus on health care and using technology to enable ourselves to be more empowered. We can also change where health care happens, traditionally in the hospital, in the clinic, but increasingly the pressures and the costs are taking healthcare out of the hospital to our homes and even onto our own bodies. Now, in the 10 years or so before I, since I came back to Stanford for fellowships in hematology and oncology, a lot of technology has exploded. It's a very exciting age, and it gives us the opportunity to do brave new things. Many technologies are moving at an exponential rate, doubling, doubling in their power and performance. The smartphones in your pockets have more than a billion times the price and speed and performance of the best supercomputers in the 1970s. And this Moore's law of, of, of IT and technology is happening not just in computers, it's happening in many fields. And it's when those technologies come together and they converge and the opportunity to rethink many elements of our society, including that of health and medicine. We've thought, we've reimagined many things in the last decade, how we read books, how we take photos. Many companies have been disrupted, like Kodak, and other companies like, like BlackBerry have almost disappeared, because technology can be disruptive, and it can be disruptive in healthcare. One element that's getting disrupted is the use of personal genomics. The price of sequencing your own human genome has dropped from a billion dollars, it's dropped at twice the rate of Moore's Law, to about one or two thousand dollars today. Um, you can have your, your genome on a disk. The challenge is when a patient comes to me with their genome on a, a hard drive, we still don't know yet what to do with that. There's lots of opportunities to learn and converge that information. And it's beyond just genomics. It's our proteome. It's the data from our blood, our environmental data, imaging, um, the bugs in our gut, our microbiome. All those information can come together. And as Hippocrates said, early proponent of personalized medicine, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little, not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. And the safest way to medicine is to truly individualize that. We're able to individualize care now with high-speed computing so we can do incredible imagery so a surgeon can appreciate the anatomy of a, a specific patient. We're able to look inside the brain now, not only to appreciate the anatomy at high resolution, but increasingly the connectome and mapping the brain and understanding psychiatric diseases and treating those in better ways. We're using high-speed computing to disrupt and change old procedures, like an angiogram to look at the heart, can now be done with a 30-second CT scan. We can scan the heart, send it to the cloud, analyze the blood vessel, and determine, does that patient need a stent or bypass surgery? What used to take... Uh, an operating room and a catheter and lots of radiation now can be done, again, computationally. And we can determine, does that patient need a stent or other therapy? So we're disrupting cardiology. Soon we won't have echocardiograms. We'll do a 10-minute cardiac MRI and analyze the function and structure of the heart on a tablet, a smart pad, or your phone anywhere on the planet. 
So with faster technology and smaller technology, we're clearly changing the way we practice healthcare. The smartphones in your pocket have become healthcare tools. And you know, it's only been three years since the iPad came out. That's become a disruptive force in changing the way we practice medicine, tablets. In fact, the cheapest tablets today are only $35. Imagine the impact of giving away a $35 tablet in education and healthcare and beyond. And we can use these mobile technologies to also give us dashboards into our data. If you're a diabetic patient, you can record your blood sugar directly onto your phone, get a dashboard of your numbers, understand what that means, and have a better, do a better job yourself and as your clinical team of, of treating your diabetes. And simple apps, again, can give us those feedback loops. And soon, instead of always giving a drug or vaccine, we'll prescribe an app. There'll be an app for pregnancy, an app for surgery, that can really help tune and personalize your therapy. We're in the age of gamification, making patients more engaged and on top of their own uh, therapy, using gaming technologies like Microsoft Connect to make things like physical therapy easier and more fun. We're in the age now of digital medicine. All this faster computing is digitizing our data. And with digital information now, we can again leverage our mobile platforms to take pictures of our skin lesions, analyze those, diagnose eye disease, the, the, the case of my smartphone here can measure my EKG and send it anywhere on the planet. We're in the age of what's called the quantified self. And as Hippocrates said, you know, walking is man's best medicine. Now, wearing new devices, I'm wearing three of them, one, two, three, I can track my walking, I can track my steps. And there's a whole new generation of low-cost consumer technology, including connected blood pressure cuffs, you know, blood pressure. One in three Europeans has high blood pressure. Now we can control that and measure it and have a feedback loop. So simple technologies like connected blood pressure cuffs and quantified health can make a huge difference. There are now tattoos that can measure your vital signs and dashboards of our own body. I'm actually wearing a small patch, a $2 disposable patch. If you can switch to my vital signs, you'll actually be able to see it transmit through my phone, uh, my vitals. And if, I, if it was showing here, I'd run around the stage. We can switch over um, and you'll see my live EKG uh, through my phone. Here we go, there's my EKG. Okay, only 132 beats a minute. My stress level is only 100%. No problem. <laughs> and if I run around, and if I fall down, it could call emergency or call my mom. So this sort of technology <laughs> is getting powerful and is disposable and will, will help us control and treat disease in smarter ways. So new tools are coming to physicians and patients. Uh, digital tools to make better physical exams for a nurse or for a patient at home. We're using the power of, of low-cost um, um, uh, uh, laboratories. A single drop of blood now can give us incredible levels of measurement that were never possible before at very, very low cost. We can even print out some of our laboratory tests. So the idea of a digital checkup anywhere on the planet, whether it's a rural island off the coast of Greece or rural India, combined with telemedicine, being able to interact with a, a physician or a, uh, anybody else through your smart tablets, is really changing the way we practice healthcare and enabling us to have better healthcare for our older generation. They don't have to come to the hospital all the time uh, and to the lab. Now, it's no one technology. It's the layering of these technologies, the Internet of Things. Even our new pacemakers have IP addresses and can be connected. They can also be hacked, by the way, so there's a dark side. So we need to understand how to put these together in smart ways and not be overwhelmed. You know, our brains haven't had an upgrade in millions of years, but our technology keeps getting upgraded. And so it's very easy as, as patients, as doctors, as healthcare systems to be overwhelmed by data. So how do we make sense of this? As Hippocrates also said, life is short, the art is long. We could be reading every paper in my field I could never keep up. So the new field of artificial intelligence is gonna dramatically change how we practice medicine. And I like to call it not AI, but IA, intelligence augmentation, because it's going to help augment us. Hippocrates also said, science is the father of knowledge. Now we have so much science and knowledge, how do we integrate that together? Some doctors are threatened by this. Even Socrates thought that reading and writing uh, was not a good idea. But if we embrace some of these technologies, it can dramatically improve healthcare, because there's so much inefficiency. We waste 30% of our healthcare dollars, and we're not often smart about what we do. There's a lot of medical errors. So by using the integration of sensors, big data, artificial intelligence, your car. You know more about the health of your new car than you do. There's thousands, hundreds of sensors in new cars. You care about when your own check engine light goes on. And systems like OnStar for your car could eventually become the OnStars for your body and integrate all this information in smart and powerful ways. Might be some Star Trek fans here. The tricorder is no longer science fiction. There's now what used to be a $100,000 ultrasound can fit in my pocket, right? 
And there's even an X Prize. You met Peter Diamandis here last year, the founder of the X Prize. There's now a new X Prize I helped design to make a medical tricorder to be at home for patients and consumers to use to do a better job than physicians. And many companies are developing these. Um, one company that I helped get started called Scanadu has developed a technology, hold it to your forehead, it pulls up all your vital signs, talks to your phone, communicates with your healthcare team. This is a view of where this might be in the next couple of years as we put all this technology together. Take a look. Technology has given us an unprecedented window into the human body. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we're still in the dark about our own health. We are changing that. You okay? Do you feel okay? What if instead of fearing the worst when you notice something out of the ordinary, you could identify the condition yourself? Getting the right diagnosis would save you worry. It says it's roseola. And an unnecessary doctor's visit. Rest at home, it's okay. Instead of hearing about a viral outbreak on the news, imagine you got an alert that was tailored to your family's needs. It would also give you advice about what to do next. What if you had a way to identify what was wrong right away? A way to get all of the information you need to understand the situation. And in serious cases, you would know when and where to seek help. We're building a way for people to check their bodies as often as they check their email. It's all possible. And it's only the beginning. Now, that's not science fiction. These technologies have been built. They'll be on sale next year. In fact, this company crowdsourced the funding of their next clinical, clinical trial. So we can now have an era of connected healthcare where we can share our information and make sense of it. The social network is very important to our health. And it's not our genetics that are most important for our health. It's actually our social networks. It's our behavior. And as Hippocrates also said, it's far more important to know the person the disease has than the disease that the person has. So understanding the social construct can enable me to influence you to behave better and have better habits. If you can look in the mirror in the morning and see healthy you, right? Or what happens if you have too many baklava, right? Uh, you can change how you might be wiring your behavior. I can now download an app and see myself today and 1,000 baklava later changes my thinking, right? Um, or if I'm trying to influence a patient to stop smoking, what they might look like in 20 years that they keep smoking, or if they spend too much time on Facebook, for example, right? So <laughs> we can use technologies, including telepresence, new ways of using robotics to interact as clinicians, new ways of having low-cost um, telepresent robots to visit our friends and family and interact, both in medicine and beyond. We're using robotics to enable the disabled. And there's a lot of innovation going on with robotics. In fact, I was a judge last week at the Google Science Fair, and a young, uh, he, uh, Harry, a young um, student, 17-year-old here from Greece, has developed a robotic exoskeleton to help his grandmother. That's Harry. <laughs> and robotics is enabling the severely disabled, those who have paralyzed, completely paralyzed, to connect their brains to robotic limbs. So we have an incredible ability now to change the way the disabled interact with the environment. We're seeing robotics that are now wearable, wearable exoskeletons. So someone who's paralyzed, for example, can put on a wearable exoskeleton and climb a mountain. And it's, it's going beyond that. We really want to cure spinal cord injury. And the next generation of regenerative medicine can enable that. She and Yamanaka there won the Nobel Prize last year for developing induced pluripotent stem cells, cells that you can turn your own skin cells into any cell in your body. So we have the opportunity to have extreme remedies and build a fountain of youth and converge technologies like 3D printing. I'm actually wearing a 3D printed belt. You'll hear from the next speaker more about 3D printing. But 3D printing can be applied to healthcare from neurosurgery to next generation prosthetics to uh, orthopedics um, to even being able to scan my own, uh, own self and have a little, uh, little version of mini-me, right? So it's cute, but what if I have, might have cancer and I've lost part of my face? We can make a prosthetic or combine that with bionics. So incredible potential to eventually 3D print the organs of the future from simple ones we can do today to complex ones in the future like our hearts. Now, I've been diving into this world as the uh, uh, head of a medicine track at a new institution called Singularity University based in the heart of Silicon Valley. And our mission is to cross-fertilize technologies and to say how can we take exponential technologies, put them together to solve global problems like even global health. 
and a uh, student from Greece, uh, Andreas, formed a company called Matternet at Singularity University to use drones to deliver drugs and vaccines, a better way of delivering um, medicines in parts of the world with poor transportation. Other students built gloves for telemedicine. We're also formed a, I formed a program at Singularity University called Future Med, where we bring together doctors and researchers and scientists from all sorts of fields to rethink and reinvent medicine in new and powerful ways. And I hope some of you can join us at Future Med this November. Let's go to futuremed2020.com, where we rethink the future of healthcare. So many new people are coming to healthcare. You don't need to be a doctor or a, a, a roboticist to go into healthcare today. Any field can impact healthcare. In fact, even Google is now approaching uh, longevity and, and, and a new, new company to think about longevity in healthcare. And we're bringing new folks with beginner's mind, even designers. Design thinking is important. Like if I'm flying back tomorrow uh, to California, I need new technologies. You know, Oh, by the way, you can do smart things with your furniture to help older folks get up and, and have smart design in our environments um, and even our, our walking canes. We need smart design thinking. If I'm flying, I don't want to put wings on my car. I need a 747, and the 747 doesn't fly by itself. It needs a whole system, right? So we can take lessons, actually, from aviation and other fields to apply to healthcare. I've been a pilot for 20 years since college, and I've had the opportunity to fly in, in fighter jets as a flight surgeon in the Air National Guard. And there's lessons to take from aviation, from the fighter pilot world, from the military that apply to healthcare, like checklists. We use checklists to make flying safer. We're using checklists to make the operating room safer. So checklists have been applied and dramatically improved outcomes in that regard, and we can amplify checklists and personalize those. The idea of simulation. Simulation has made flying safer. Now we can simulate procedures and do training for surgeons and nurses and medical students. And we, instead of see one, do one, teach one, we see one and simulate it and get it right and get and practice it. Not on our grandmothers, we practice it in the simulation lab. We're using the world of the new cockpit that is now digitized. We can see our world in new ways and, and make the data information actionable. Even Lockheed Martin is helping create the new um, uh, intensive care units at Johns Hopkins. We, in the fighter pilot world, use heads-up display. We need other information in bad weather. It might remind us we're about to hit a mountain. It'll give us a cue, if there's sound. Um, we can sometimes use it, different information if we're in a dogfight. Uh, we use feedback loops in our cars now. We might soon have a GPS for our own health care. It says, Daniel, go to the right to the gym, not to left to the McDonald's, right? It helps guide us, right? We want just the right amount of information, not too much information also. We're seeing the world in new ways. The, the blind now have visual prosthetics to help them see. And we're also, as sighted people, seeing the world differently. We have new technologies being developed, like an assisted living contact lens, so we can see the world maybe through our contacts. It might have some interesting implications. You might be wearing your assisted living contact lenses and be out on a date, and you need a little bit of help, so you bring up the Wingman app, right? <laughs> All right, so some interesting implications. But <laughs> do we need to wait for, for those? No, today... We're in the era of, of eyewear. Google Glass is here, right? Google Glass is going to be transformative, I think, in many fields, including healthcare. As a doctor, I can see my patient's vital signs. As a patient, I can understand my medicines and, and, and be more on track with things, okay? We might see our food in different ways. And another Greek saying, everything in excess is opposed to nature. What if you're having a little bit of excess? You might have a clue, you know, from your visual uh, cues. You might have another clue, right? Pull up, pull up. From the fighter pilot world, right? Pull up. Pull up. Um, finally, we have the idea that there's radar. What if we can see other patients like ours or patients like mine and share that information? When you drive now and use Google Maps, you use a little privacy, but you can crowdsource that information together and share it. And now you can build a map of Rome, build a map of Rome in a day and see what's the right route to work. What's the fastest way to get there? How do you avoid the traffic jams? What if we could do that in healthcare and share our information in new and powerful ways? So in conclusion, you know, medicine traditionally has been very much blind, very empiric. Now we have new technologies, new sensors, new data being shared. We can get information about our individual neighborhoods and from our individual social networks and maybe even decide, you know, who to shake hands with each day based on that information, right? So, and we can use other ways of thinking and dashboards and contextual systems medicine to change the way we do things and design thinking. All these elements can come together to reinvent healthcare and change us from a world that's been traditionally very episodic and reactive. You have the chest pain, the lump, the, the problem, and you get seen it two days later or after the event, to changing healthcare to being continuous and proactive and leading us to a much healthier society at lower costs. And I would encourage all of you to get engaged in your own health. You don't just need to be blood donors or organ donors. You can also be data donors and change the face of health and medicine. So I think with lessons from the past, from, our, from Hippocrates and others, we can have a brave new world of healthcare. 
in many ways, like my Google Glass, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And it's up to you, not just to imagine that future, but to go out there and create it. So with that, I'll say thank you. Have a nice Thank you.